the Savior Jesus Christ, I want to welcome you all to this service for First Presbyterian Church here in Pilot Mountain this Sunday, August 20th, 2023. A few announcements that need to be made. Uh, this month, Pilot Outreach is looking for toothpaste, individually wrapped toothbrushes, dish and laundry detergents. Those can all be placed in the basket up here up front uh, that is designated for the outreach as well as taking them over to outreach. They will accept any donations over there. Uh, our blessing box is always in need of filling. Uh, over on, you can fill it up over on Needham Street. We'll place items in the closet behind the choir at any time. Our 75th anniversary is coming up on September 24th. Um, and it's on the session agenda for tomorrow, so we need volunteers uh, on a committee. We, we go to Presbyterian, we form a committee. And we need uh, volunteers for that to make this a great event. Um, so if you have any questions or would like to volunteer, please contact myself or one of the session members, and we'll get in touch with you about that. Uh, as I said, there is a session meeting tomorrow night at 7. If you have any questions or concerns about anything, please see myself or one of the elders and we'll take care of that for you. And there is a community jam session uh, this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall. <coughs> at this time, let us turn our hearts and our minds to worship in God. Thank you. 
tells us if we say that we are without sin, we are found to be lying and God is not with us. The scripture also tells us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us join together, standing in body or in spirit, confessing to God and to each other in our unison prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, while it is true that we have sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's grace and love in Jesus Christ. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say, in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. Thanks be to God.
that you have given us, we give you thanks, and we return them to you, to use for the glory of your honor here on this earthly kingdom. Be with us and guide us in your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we go now to the prayers of the people, I ask that you turn to page six of your bulletin looking over those prayer concerns from our congregation and our family and friends in our community. And I ask if there are any others that need to be added at this time. Linda. Yes, Debbie Bartlett. Debbie Bartlett? Debbie Bartlett is having surgery next month. Spinal surgery. God, we pray for the faithful all over the world, that all who love you may be united in your service. We pray for the church, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the peoples and leaders of the nations, that they may be reconciled one to another in pursuit of your justice and peace. We pray for the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who suffer from prejudice, greed, or violence, that the heart of humanity may warm with your tenderness. We pray especially for all prisoners of politics or religion, and for all refugees from wherever they may come, from Syria, from Ukraine, from Sudan, from wherever there might be oppression, and seeking of relief. We pray for all who are oppressed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all in need because of famine, food, or earthquake, that they may know the hope of your faithfulness through the help of others. We pray especially for those people of Baja and California who are expecting flooding, for those of Ukraine, those of Sudan again as they experience famine, as they experience war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the land, the sea, the sky, for your whole creation which longs for its redemption. We pray that we may live with respect for your creation and use your gifts with reverence. Again, we pray for your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who suffer the pain of sickness, the pain of loneliness, the pain of fear, the pain of loss. That those who 
whose names are in our hearts, in the hearts of others, or known to you alone, may receive strength and courage. We pray for those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy now and forever, as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. You join me now in our unison prayer for illumination. Lord God, let the words of your servant's mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the Second Testament, the letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect.
from the second book of the First Testament, Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 and 6, verses 3 through 6, sorry. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on the eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. How many of you all have ever heard of a primer? Now I'm not talking about a primer that you put on walls before you paint. But what I'm talking about is a book that was used in schools to help students learn to read and write. A book that contains some stories and quotations and other general knowledge that those who wrote the primer thought that the reader should know. Many times the information was memorized and quoted in front of a class so that many times the people who memorized these sections of the primer could quote them years later to their children to teach them the things that they thought were needed to be learned. For those that know what a primer is, how many of you have ever used one? Nobody. Interesting. They fell out of practice many years ago, apparently. But there are many in the past who learned the basic skills, as I said, of reading and writing from a primer. Now, is there a Christian primer? Something that folks have memorized and can recall without a moment's hesitation. Albert Curry Wynn believed that there is one, and so he even wrote a book entitled The Christian Primer. And in this book, Wynn makes the case that there is a Christian primer, certain things that Christians have learned over the years that they can call upon in their lives. The ones that Wynn uses are the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments. Now, I know that many of you have the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed memorized. I've watched you recite them, and it's very impressive to see that. And I'm willing to bet that many of you have memorized the Ten Commandments, but not as many as there used to be. I preached a couple of sermon series on the Lord's Prayer and on the Apostles' Creed, and I thought that it was now time to tackle the Ten Commandments. <coughs> so I want to begin with an introduction to the commandments, and over the next few weeks we will cover those commandments in detail and remind us of what God charged the Hebrews to remember and to live. The commandments are words to live by and words to emulate, and so a study of them would be helpful to us all. The first things first. The commandments are what belong to the Hebrew Bible, what I like to call the First Testament, or what is known as the Old Testament. They are found in the second and fifth books of the Torah, or the Pentateuch, which is, of course, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. They are given to a people who have been taken out of bondage by God and led to a promised land. Now, in Hebrew, they're known as the Ten Words, and they've been divided in several ways between the Hebrew text and the Christian world. And I won't go into all the divisions, needless to say, there are many. And Christians of Protestant and Roman Catholic are still debating how those divisions should be. But one division I will touch on is that of the tablets. It is said that the commandments or words were brought down on two tablets. If you've ever watched History of the World, Part 1 by Mel Brooks, it is not three, where he comes down and says, I can't be brighter than these 15, and he drops one, these 10 commandments to you all. That is not what it is. There's two tablets. And the first tablet establishes the duties that are to be given to God. These contain the phrase, the Lord your God, in every one of them. The second tablet 
is the duties to human beings. It's a set of ethics. And so the division is that the two tablets are usually this. The first four commandments are given to God. The next six are given with human beings. So the question is raised, why do we include these in a Christian primer? Why not just a Hebrew primer? And are these not the law? Are we not a people of grace and no more under the law? It would seem so to Paul, who said in many places that he believed that the law was not to be followed any longer by Christians. A few points that he makes are this. The law enslaves and brings death. It arouses sinful passions and makes us to know sin. It gives sin strength and life. By sin, it kills us. All in all, Paul makes it sound like a curse rather than a blessing. It's one of the things over which the death of Jesus had victory. Why is this in a Christian primer? And Martin Luther had even less to say about the law. He believed that law and gospel should be far apart. But he did find some profit in the law. He looked at it having been good for two reasons. The first was that it served as a bridle to the wicked and to the good of the civil government. In other words, it was seen as a deterrent. The second was that it was used as a hammer. It was something to show us our self-righteousness, break down the wall that divided us between God and each other and sent us running to Christ. For Luther, that was all the good that was in the law. But according to the First Testament, the, the law is a good thing. Psalms 1 and 119 are just a few of the texts that show the delight in the law. In fact, the psalmist in 119 says that the word or the law is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And that I treasure your word or law in my heart. Jesus said that he had come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And John Calvin even said that there was good in the law. He recognized the points that Luther had made, that it was a deterrent and that it was a hammer. But he also said there was a third use, and for him it was the principal use. It was a teaching tool. It was to teach believers more thoroughly what God's will is and to urge them into well-doing. Now, seen from these angles, the commandments do belong in a Christian primer. So why are there divergent views? Why do these two views seem so far apart? Why are they there? Well, let's look at the positive views first. Israel had been enslaved in Egypt. God delivered them out of slavery, delivered them from the pursuing Egyptians and brought them to Mount Sinai. And there God said to them, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my commandment, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the people. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. The commandments or the words that follow in Exodus 20 are not a recipe for gaining God's favor. They are not, if you do this, then you gain my favor. The favor, the grace has already been gained. They are not requirements for how to live so that God will take them out of bondage. That had already occurred as well. What they are is a blueprint for how to live as God's people. Grace precedes duty, and the grace was given before the commandments. The negative view of the law that comes from Paul comes from his background. Paul was a Pharisee, and in the day of Paul, the Pharisees misunderstood the law. They believed that if all Israel kept the law from one Sabbath to another, a whole week, then God would send the Messiah who would come and deliver them from the Romans. Can you see how this would put a yoke on people? They were a way now to personal self-righteousness. They were a way of looking and saying, look at me. I keep these commandments. God must be impressed. They were a way for zealous Christians who 
believe that converts must become Jews first and follow the law. Again, can you see why Paul was so zealous against the law? Why he condemned it? Why he said it was a yoke that had been placed up in his, against the freedom of Christians? And Luther. Luther was based in a merit-based thinking as well. Of if you did this, then God will be pleased and do this. You had to do your part, though, to get God's grace and God's favor. I know that I struggle with it myself. I look to see if I follow the commandments and good things will happen to me. But that only enslaves me more. The law was there to show us a way to follow God, not a way to earn God's favor. And as with the Israelites, the favor has already been granted, and there is nothing that we can do or earn it or make it better. But where is the promise, as the, the sermon title says, you might ask? Well, when it states for centuries that we have stressed the demand side of the commandments, the you shall not, you shall not, you shall. This is the way we see it. But there is a promise side to these words as well. In the Hebrew, the words are worded to the future. You shall not. That's a future statement which implies that one will look at these in the future as well as in the present. You're not to do it now, but you shall not do it in the future as well. Wynn points out that the negative future can also express a promise. As my people, you will not have other gods. You will not make graven images to worship. You will not kill, commit adultery, steal, lie, covet. He says, imagine a world and a society where these things are so ingrained in us. Now imagine a world where because we have followed these commandments, these things no longer exist. That is a promise. You shall not. And one day you won't have to worry about it anymore. <coughs> Transforms these demands from something of a list of no no's to something that promises a living future here and now, as though the kingdom has already come and that we are God's people. Isn't that something to look forward to? The Ten Commandments are here in Christianity yet for a reason. We cannot understand our future unless we understand our past. I was told in seminary that to understand the New Testament, one had to know the Old Testament. You can't figure it out because it's so ingrained. They go together. When we look at each commandment, we'll see in turn the demand and the promise of God. And remember, these are not boring rules that are there to tell us that God is going to get you. But they are to conform us to promises of what life will be like when we no longer must have them with us. They are a teaching tool, and a magnificent one at that. So let us take a journey and travel together, looking at those commandments and those promises. Our affirmation of faith is from the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism. And in the Catechism, we find that all the Ten Commandments, as well as in the other Catechisms, teach you to, that teach us how to live. So let us stand together and recite what we believe. My only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own, but belong in body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That he has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also washes over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, 
all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. He would remain standing for our final hymn, number 697, verses 1, 2, and 3.